alive. And I'm going to hide. <laughs> I'm going to give it one minute. Four, four. <laughs> Got to keep practicing. Yeah. Get those nervous energies out. <laughs> we are on. Okay. Welcome, everyone. My name is Rona Axelrod. I am a member of the Dr. Talbot Spivak Holocaust Memorial Committee at Florida Southwestern State College. I'm also a professor of mathematics. I have the honor this evening of introducing to you the curator of the Holocaust Museum and Cohen Education Center in Naples, Florida. This is Cody Rodemaker. He's a graduate of Florida State University's Historical Administration and Public History Program in 2011 and has been with the museum since 2012. During this time, he oversaw the creation of over a dozen in-house exhibitions, as well as the creation of the museum's permanent exhibition and archives in their current location. He is presented on behalf of the museum and the public history field at the Society of Florida Archivists, the Florida Association of Museums, as well as Florida Gulf Coast University and Florida State University. Today, he continues to create special exhibits, improve the museum's permanent exhibits, and care for over a thousand artifacts the community has generally, generously donated. I am so looking forward to seeing this presentation myself. I haven't been to the new location of the museum. So if you haven't been there, this is gonna be your first look. And I would like to welcome Cody and hand it over to him now. Thank you so much, Rona. We hope to see you actually in the museum soon. That goes to you uh, in the crowd. Uh, as Rona said, I'm Cody Rodemaker, I'm the curator here. And uh, I wanna first talk a little bit about uh, the history of the museum as uh, Rona mentioned we had relatively recently moved to our new location um, from one that we've been in for quite some time. So just wanted to go and give a little history about the museum and where we came from. We really did come from the community itself because in 1997 and 1998 school year, students at Golden Gate Middle School got really, really interested and very passionate about learning more about the Holocaust. Their Social studies teacher, David Bell, and their art teacher, Michelle Lee, worked with them to actually develop an exhibit that became known as Out of the Ashes. And this exhibition went from being in the school to actually touring uh, throughout the Southwest Florida region, including being at the Collier County Museum and Florida Gulf Coast University. So multiple counties for something students made is quite impressive. Uh, from there, they started thinking about like, what are we gonna do with this? Well, that's where the community stepped in to help out because uh, groups like the, uh, the Jewish Federation of Greater Naples, uh, local businessmen, and even local survivors and liberators that were just living in the community said, you know what kids, you've done an incredible job and we want to continue what you've been trying to do, which is teach the story of the Holocaust to others. And so they actually put up the money and helped develop the museum itself in its first location. About a year there, the museum actually applied and successfully became a nonprofit organization. And that is really our anniversary. And so that happened in 2001. And it being 2021, it is our 20th anniversary. And we're really excited. And that's one reason why I'm really happy to be here today. So I can, you know, uh, cheer on the museum and show that the museum is still wanting to work with the community and still wanting to tell the stories of the local community, even on a day like Crystal Night. So as we all know, today is Crystal Night. It's a commemorative day. It spanned the night of the 9th and into the morning of the 10th. Um, a very painful and very scary event, to say the least. 
for the Jewish community in Germany and its annexed territories. And those effects, you know, we can see that kind of stuff in members of our community because survivors live here. Uh, we've worked extensively with survivors. They've donated numerous objects, which we'll go over a few of them in just a moment, but also their descendants have actually worked very closely with the museum and worked to tell their family stories as well. Some great examples are actually coming up in the uh, next day. Uh, for example, Richard Stein will be speaking with Florida Southwestern, as well as our board member and volunteer Stuart Mess will be speaking with them sometime soon. And it's through these individuals, be it second generation survivors or direct survivors of the Holocaust, in particular Kristallnacht, that we get to tell stories through their artifacts, through their testimonies, that they've been so kind to donate and spend time recording. So their stories will last beyond their lifetime. It's powerful stuff. So let's begin. We have three collections we are going to go over today. The first one actually comes from local survivor, Henny Porter, who has worked a lot with the museum uh, as a volunteer, absolutely wonderful woman, but, uh, and also a survivor of Crystal Knox herself. Uh, today, we're going to actually use her collection to talk specifically about what caused Crystal Knox to occur. So if you don't mind me for a moment, I actually have to get some gloves on because like any good museum employee, if I'm handling artifacts directly, I'm going to be safe about it. And human hands give off little oils that can be bad for artifacts in the long run. So always play it safe, nice and dexterous. It might look familiar, they're the same things that doctors use when you're you know, visiting them. Nice nitro gloves. So the first item we have here is a dagger of all things. Pretty intimidating uh, item. This is actually a part, this is actually part of the uniform of the Sturm Abtelo, or the SA, or brown shirts. To put it very nicely, they are the thugs and the sort of the ground troops that the Nazis used, especially early on in their rise to power, actively fighting communists and other groups in the streets, and were used oftentimes to harass and harangue the Jewish communities that lived near them. Now, this one was actually donated by Henny uh, in, on behalf of her family, and in particular, her father, Morris Katz. Now, Morris was a Polish-born Jewish man living in Germany. And he actually received, he actually acquired this dagger before escaping himself. This is after uh, what I'm actually about to tell you and then some. So, Morris, again, I just mentioned, he was a uh, Polish Jewish man. In, and that came to affect him in a pretty serious way and eventually actually greatly affected the Jewish community throughout Europe because Morris was part of a massive roundup of about 17,000 Polish born Jews living in Germany. Germany decided near the end of October to expel these people back to Poland. So they didn't have to deal with them but very nicely. Because at this time, the Nazi government very much focused on expulsion to make their country free of these inferior peoples, especially the Jewish community. So Penny, in her testimonies, describes seeing the SS visit her home, speak with her father, who pretty much tell them, tells them to pack their things and join them, where he is, like, again, 17,000 other people sent to the east border of Germany, west border, western border of Poland, sort of this, um, again, this borderlands. And Poland 
very surprised from that suddenly there's this massive influx of Poles, of Polish citizens, I could say, on their border. It was like, we got to do something. So they set up two uh, refugee camps along that border because they don't want to accept them in fully. They don't really want to accept them um, because that's a huge burden on the state as they looked at it. So the main one was actually set up in a town called Feichen. Uh, any fluent Polish speakers, my apologies. Uh, I took Russian and should have taken German as well. So my apologies if my pronunciation is a little off on that. But this town, uh, it became infamous amongst the Jewish community. And some of the people that ended up there were able to either get messages out or had their situation communicated outside of this sort of border region of Germany and Poland. And someone who heard about this, because his parents were in Bayesian, was a man by the name of Herschel Greenspan. That name is probably sounding very familiar if you have uh, a familiarity with the Holocaust and in particular the Stalin. For those who don't, Herschel Greenspan was a young man who had been living in Paris illegally, actually, uh, when he found out his parents were being held in this refugee camp and what the Nazis were doing. In anger and trying to draw attention to this fight, Herschel purchased a handgun, went to the German consulate in Paris, and shot a very minor official named Ernst von Rath. So, because of this expulsion, and because of the anger of Herschel Greenspan, the Nazis were given an opportunity to act later on. But it's important to also recognize, again, that personal local connection that this little girl that we now know is Penny had her father taken away for at least a decent amount of time as this was being sorted out between the governments. And Morris Katz himself was being held in less than ideal conditions, to put it nicely. But because Penny was kind enough to donate that dagger as well as speak with us about her family's story, we're able to bring that to you and bring you a little more understanding of how Crystal Knot came to be. So, just mentioned, Greenspan uh, shot Ernst von Rath. Two days later, that is when von Rath dies. The Nazis decide to capitalize on this. And they do this by wanting to sort of make it feel like it was this natural uprising of the German people in anger. They look at it and they like they want it to seem like the Volk were acting on behalf of the death of this minor official against the state enemy that was the Jewish people. So they start communicating with their different Gao, their different political regions, the Gao leaders, start organizing against the Jewish communities in their regions with a mix of people in uniform and people in plain clothes. So just your everyday wear. So it looked like there was a natural reaction to this, this organic build to the, the, what we think of as the looting, the burning, the attacks. And that's leading to our next object here, which if you look next to me, this little can rectangle here, that came from the Simcoe family, specifically Paul Simcoe. He was a, a young boy and him, his father Sigmund and his mother Lily watched crystal knot starting to occur watching the lootings, watching people being attacked in the streets, watching cultural religious sites be attacked and defaced. And they were watching this through the night until early 
on the tent. There's a knock at their door. And Sigmund, Paul's father, had to think fast. And that's exactly what he does. Because when he opens the door, he looks at two men there who are supposed to loot his house for all their valuables and all their work and arrest him, most likely. And he says to them with a Viennese accent, hey, it's my birthday. We have coffee and cakes here. You guys must be tired from all that looting and arresting you've been doing. How about you come on in, sit down, and relax for a little bit, and you know, sort of rebuild your stamina? So these two looters look at each other and shrug their shoulders. Okay. And that is exactly what they do. They come in. Paul remembers vividly how they seemed to be talking like they were best friends for years. The looters were making Jewish jokes. Uh, they were having coffee, sweets. They were talking about the local soccer games that were occurring. And this goes on for a little while. And Paul sees them starting to get up, get ready to leave. And two big things happen that day, or at that time, I should say. One, they look and say, listen, this has been fun, but we gotta leave with something. Just to say, yes, we took their values. So Paul's mom, Lily, just in a knee-jerk reaction, starts taking off all and any of jewelry she has on her and hands it over immediately. And because of that, they actually receive that receipt, that little brown square I mentioned in the very beginning there. And if you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but it says 10 November 38. And it is estimated around approximately 700 Reichsmarks that were the valuables they took from the family. So that's the first thing that has happened. The second thing that happens to the Simcoe family at this time is as they're getting ready to go, they pat Sigmund on the shoulder and say, you're, in, you're a good one. You get to stay. And he is the only person, only Jewish man, I should say, in that apartment building that was not detained, arrested, and almost assuredly sent to a concentration camp because of Kristoff. Because if you're not familiar, as part of Kristoff, over 30,000 Jewish men were arrested on that night, effectively for just being Jewish. Men. So through this quick thinking and through this receipt, Paul was kind enough to donate to us. We get to tell you about such a unique story of quick wits and survival on a baseline. Just through such an amazing surprise on this trip. So we've talked about where it's come, where the origins of Christmas life were. We've talked about a very personal experience. Let's talk about one more, one that falls a little more in the lines of what we usually think of when it comes to crystal night. And that is the story that uh, I find personally really powerful because it's actually the story of the museum's first curator and my mentor when it comes to how we approach discussing the Holocaust with the community, Lori Mayer. Lori was a little girl on the day, November 9th. She was with her family, her father, Julius, and her mother, Martha. And she remembered this in detail in her testimonies, how the SS, the Schutzstaffel, this security group, um, came to her 
house, which was just above their shop. So similar to like a Mercado, like a Mercado here, where you have a business on the floor and then you have housing above. And they came to confiscate valuables on behalf of the German government. And they looted the house, tossed everything around, pretty much turned the whole thing upside down, looking for anything they could consider confiscatable. Because of that, Julius looks to the family like, listen, we're not going to open the shop today. Keep the shutters, keep the security shutters closed. I've got to go tell my family in Berlin what's going on. So they, he goes from their little sort of suburb area, Eberswald, just outside of Berlin, into the city itself to warn his family about what was going on and what happened to him. That left Lori and her mother, Martha, to clean up the house, clean up their shop, and try to just for, put things back together. And they, that's what they do for most of the day. Until late afternoon, light, it's starting to get darker out, but not dark enough yet that they need to put on like lights or anything like that. But Lori remembered vividly, very powerfully, this people gathering around the shop, this closed shop, no lights on, nothing saying that they're open. And remembers people starting to sing, starting to chant. And they, they're singing the German national anthem, the Nazi regime's national anthem, and chanting things like, Jews come out, Jews come out, we want to kill you. And that's the moment when Martha looks to her daughter and says, grab your coat, we need to leave. And they escape out of their house into side streets. And as it gets darker, they avoid street lamps. They avoid well-lit areas, well-lit buildings, trying to find some place to stay, to hide. Because they know that there's a target on them just for who they are, for what religion they are, what perceived race they are. And they eventually find that after the board was it what felt like hours. And that's of all places with the Eberswald police. They speak with the police chief, who's like, we'll protect you. And their protection was hiding them in a back room, letting them sleep there if they slept at all. And they make it through the night. And Julius comes back to the family shop. He sees that the mob had broken through the security gate, shutters, busted through the display windows. You can see a little bit of that in a mural here. Similar idea. And he sees that they, the products that they were intending to sell have been dragged into the street and covered in tar. This is on top of phrases like Yuda, Jew, graffiti on the building, swastikas and things like that. But no sign of his family. So he goes searching and eventually finds them at the police department. And this story is like so many even though it's very personal, there's so many people who own businesses or part of the Jewish community had a similar experience of having their livelihoods destroyed in a single night. And not only their livelihoods, but their community centers. And I bring that up because Lori's family was directly affected by that. Because the photos behind me were donated on behalf of Lori. They, she did not take them, but she donated them to the museum for use. This is the Ebersvold synagogue with its main 
dome on fire during Christmas. This is the synagogue Lori's family went to. And along these lines is the image here of the interior of the Eversolve synagogue. You can imagine Lori's family sitting in the pews, well, what remains of those pews. And so much was looted, so much was damaged. And only one positive thing comes from this part of the story, and that's that the church across the street from the Eversolve synagogue seeing it was on fire, ran in and saved the Torah that would have surely either been destroyed or confiscated by the Nazis as part of the spoils of this pogrom. So through these three collections, through Henny's Porter's dagger, we were able to tell the story of how her father was part of the roundup that led to uh, the death of Ernst von Roth and eventually Kristall Nacht. Through the receipt, we see a very personal story of escaping barely because of quick thinking. And through glories, we get to see what happened to thousands of businesses and thousands of and hundreds of synagogues across Germany and Germany's annexed territories like Austria, things like that at this time. And we're very fortunate we get to tell those stories through these images, through these artifacts. And we really appreciate that they've been willing to donate not only those materials, but in their stories, so I can bring them to you. So we hope from these stories, we can recognize when these things are going to happen again, or at least see some signs of them. And we hope that like that good police chief, we'll recognize when people need help. And we hope that not just myself, but you guys as well, and you know, those you find fear and love to speak with and communicate, will recognize that we can work against bigotry, hatred, and violence, and hopefully prevent another event like this from happening, or at least working against it if it does occur. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I think I will, I believe I will be passing over to Rona in case there's been any questions so far. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. Um, we have uh, just a couple questions in the chat. And we have one question is, what is your favorite artifact that's at the Holocaust Museum? Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, I think one of my very favorites, it comes from the first collection that I actually processed for the museum back in 2012. It is actually a card from the Jewish Culture League that formed in the early 1933-34 in response to the barring of uh, Jewish people from being in the arts, specifically state-sponsored arts, like theaters, operas, things like that, and actually formed as a parallel organization that was actively petitioned by uh, members of like stage crews to the Nazi government and was like, listen, we want to still do these things. And we want to have a part, sense of community and cultural life still. And if we can't do it through your, your support, we want to be able to support it ourselves. So we have a membership card from that. And it's really, it's between that and honestly, Simcoe's crystal democracy, because that's just so powerful. It's such a unique thing to actually see and it's so fragile, so we've had to take such care of it. And you can tell it's been opened and closed and was held and sort of rubbed against itself over time. So it's this fascinating item that requires such delicate care. So I, I love that one as well. So it's really a point flip between those two. Either an item of sort of trying to preserve community 
or trying to preserve and document what occurred on such an event like this going on. Cody, we also have a question um, that's asking about the history of the museum. How was it founded? How was it started? And how did it get to this point today? Uh, we, you're in a new location. Talk about the programs that you yeah. offer. Yes, well, uh, we, we started out again like uh, with building from the student-made exhibit called Out of the Ashes. So again, that, this uh, exhibit was made in 1997, 98. And for a couple of years, it was traveling around, things like that. And then survivors, the Jewish uh, Federation of Greater Naples, and like local businessmen like Homer Helter, were all like, you know, we need, this is important. We need to sort of get this place a home so it can continue being a resource for the community. That's really where we came from. And we do uh, still even use some of the items directly from that exhibition. So if you ever do visit the museum and you see something that says from the Out of the Ashes collection, that is something the students either made or acquired as a part of the original exhibit. And it's from that exhibit we developed our subsequent exhibitions in the uh, Sandalwood Square Plaza that we were in for about 20 years. So we moved from that first location about a year, year or two later into the second location when we became a nonprofit standalone organization. And then because of the generosity of the community of Southwest Florida, we were actually able to raise enough funds to acquire our new location. Full out, no more renting, which is pretty awesome in my book. Uh, we actually own the current site location of our museum. And we're always looking at how we can expand not only content wise, but you know, if things become available. We're hoping that we can expand physically as well in the future. So we went from student made exhibit that we still use parts of today to a more formalized exhibition space that we were at for about 20 years. And then in 2019, we actually moved into our current location using many, many of the same objects, images, and things like that, uh, just in different ways from our previous location. <laughs> I know you have partnered with several of the educational institutions in the area at GCU, as well as um, FSW has been working with you. Do you also have outreach to the public schools as well? Oh, yes, we have quite a bit of outreach. I mean, everything was a little slowed down for the past year or so, I and mean, who hasn't been affected by that? Uh, but we have been very active, especially with the Lee and Collier County uh, school systems, especially Collier County had some wonderful programs, including one called that was the 5810 program, where uh, it was designed that every student that was either in fifth, eighth, or 10th grade either went through the museum or took part in activities that were age appropriate with the museum. So we were going out to them, they were coming to us, and we've done this with, I believe, five counties at this point, we have reached out in some way, shape, or form that forms the, the Southwest Florida region. Of, and it's been absolutely wonderful. And we're hoping as things get better, we're going to see that uptick. I believe I even heard some rumblings in the museum from our education uh, staff that there's already been some reservations being made. So uh, I'm pretty happy about that. And it'll be great to see students in here, taking part in activities, taking part in tours, and being able to send staff out again to be part of that education program, that, that the education programs here in Southwest Florida. We have a question um, kind of related to the museum, not necessarily the Holocaust. It says, what are some things we should do at home to protect personal artifacts such as photos, letters, or diaries from older generations? That is right up my alley, to be honest. I am a, I was formally trained to be an archivist. As I joke, we like to preserve the bare bones of history so historians can come along and be like, can you believe I found this thing? And it's like, yeah, I know you did because you asked me where it was. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, there's a lot you can do at home. It's all pretty sensible stuff. If you think something's important, keep it in an area that's 
climate control. It doesn't have to be like in a special box or anything like that. If you can spring for it, awesome, but it's not necessary. Uh, but ultimately, you want to keep a stable environment for your stuff. So you want, you don't want to have it in a place that gets a lot of fluctuation. Uh, an infamous place in most houses is the attic. Attics fluctuate wildly in their heat and their humidity, which makes paper go from nice and smooth to doing waves as the humidity fluctuates. So you want to avoid that. Same thing with photos, because that's a paper base on the back. And that actually will start damaging probably crackling along the surface of your photos. Another thing you want to do is avoid intense light. So if you have a very nice painting across from a window, consider moving it, because that artifact is being hit directly with ultraviolet, infrared, and standard color, like light, visible spectrum light. And light is described as cumulative and irreversible when it comes to artifacts. So you want to be careful if something is something you really want to preserve and take care of, keep it away from intense light unless it needs to be. Heck, I use intense light when I scan objects. It's that same idea. But those are some of the best things you can do with items is keep them in a stable environment. So even a closet, um, as long as it's still in an air conditioned space is great. So please, no basements and no attics, I beg of you. I've gotten many things there where I'm like, I need to take care of mold issues and stuff like that because of these fluctuations allowed for this to happen. Um, and avoid ultimately intense amount of light for a long time. Those are the two biggest things that you can do to make something last a heck of a lot longer. And I'll admit, I take it to an extreme because I'm working in a museum uh, you'll hear some of my volunteers being like, it's so dark in here. And I'm like, it's barely below the maximum I can provide, I can make it. So we are stricter here, unsurprisingly, but we try to be reasonable where we can. And we're working like any institution to make things more visible, but also safe for our artifacts. So those are my two big things. Keep a stable environment and not too much light. Is it true that most of the artifacts in the museum are from folks that live locally? The overwhelming majority are. Or they're, um, the big caveat on that one is a lot of folks are also snowbirds. So we've had stuff arrive from folks who just winter here, but they're still part of this community, even if it's only for like four to six months of the year. And they see us and they're like, listen, we think this would be really useful for you. So we look at it and we evaluate whether it is. So yeah, I would say the vast majority of our materials do come from the community. Um, we've had some amazing things, like I've received propaganda booklets from an administrator with Colorado County School, um, again, directly from local survivors that retired, just retired here. Um, one of those items, uh, like I mentioned, that, uh, that Jewish culture leak card came from a gentleman who lived in Miami for a little while and then moved to Naples with his wife. And we received it from someone who was working at the Harry Chapin Food Bank because they found a bag of his stuff and either in the house they were cleaning out or a house they might have purchased upon his passing. So this stuff is literally coming from the community being like, I don't, so even if it's, I, you know, people coming in being like, I'm not sure what this is, but it's in German. So what's it look like to you? And we'll be happy to take a look at things for people and evaluate and see what, if they are appropriate for our, our spaces and our, our mission ultimately. So be it local, a snowbird, I've had people as far away as Seattle try to offer me things, but you know, at that point we're like, okay, try to find something a little closer to, closer to you, just for the artifact's safety. That's a long trip. <laughs> so if somebody would like to come visit the museum, are you open certain days of the week? Um, are there any restrictions they need to know about, about visiting the, the museum? We are open select days of the week right now, and uh, this might change as we get close into season, but right now we are open Wednesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays from one to four with our last entry at three o'clock. Um, Restriction-wise, 
there isn't any hard restrictions right now aside from don't lean on cases and no flash photography. Um, you'll see staff are either going to be wearing a mask or if not wearing a mask, they'll be vaccinated. So if uh, that's something you're concerned about, that's what's going on there. And we don't have, we have a strongly encouraged masking policy, but nothing required at this time. Should they make a reservation ahead of time? Because I think you're limited as far as how many you can have at the museum at one time. We do have some limitations um, when it comes to capacity. So we do recommend that if there's a particular time you really want, definitely go on to our website, hncdc.com. And I believe it's the visit tab. You'll see my purchase tickets. We can talk about times there. And uh, you can definitely reserve your time if you'd like, but we've also, we're also accepting walk-in visits. Okay. It, it was, um, while you were talking about Paul Simcoe, I had this memory that kind of popped in my head because I had the pleasure of introducing Paul Simcoe when he was a speaker at FSW. And I was reading his bio and he was born the same year as my father was born and what different path these two men had in life. It's just, it's like my dad was born in the States, whereas Paul was not. And the, the journey that he had to come to the, it, it, it just like hit me that, you know, timing is everything and you never know where life is gonna lead you. And I, I was fortunate enough to be able to meet Paul. Like I've known him through uh, several um, venues and it's just fascinating, not fascinating, but I'm, I'm happy that they're able to share their story and that we as a community can learn about it. That's so, right. yeah. <laughs> so I don't see any more questions in the chat. Cody, I want to thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, having the ability to do this through Zoom and through Facebook is incredible, a technology because of the pandemic that I hope actually stays in place because this opens up opportunities for Pete for more than just the local community to see what artifacts you have and what um, information you can share with the uh, with the community. So thank you so much for your time tonight. And thank, thank you, you for you. yeah yeah and thank you for the participants coming in and for your questions and. Uh, Check out the, uh, the schedule on fsw.edu, the event calendar. You can see the, uh, the other programs that we have scheduled for tomorrow. And